Today is July 15th, 2010. I'm interviewing John Croach at his home in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. Interviewer is Eileen Hurst from Central Connecticut State University. John, for the record, would you state your name, your date of birth, and your present address? Name is John F. Kroos. Date of birth is November 1st, 1923. John, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Do you recall the year? 1942. And can you tell me why you did that? I did that because the majority of my friends who were much older than I that I associated with were either drafted or enlisting, and at, the pre at that time, I was a sophomore in school in Boston, Massachusetts, and I felt that it was my duty to get into the conflict. They let you enlist when you were still in high school? I had to get, no, college, oh. sophomore year of college. I had to get permission from my parents who were somewhat reluctant to sign for me because at that time they were drafting at age 21 and I had just turned 19. However, fortunately they did sign for me. And you were living in Boston at the time? I was residing, at, I left school in Boston and I was residing in Hartford, yes. Oh, so you were from Hartford, Connecticut? That's correct. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? I felt that the training that I might obtain from them would be superior and beneficial to me in the event of any uh, future combat. After you enlisted, do you recall being inducted in basic training? I recall very vividly going to Paris Island, South Carolina because it was an experience that I will never forget. I relish it, it very, very sincerely. It was difficult, uh, let me say unbelievable, primarily to meet the number of people from various parts of the country that was, until that time, restricted. Because I was a local boy, and naturally I'd done some traveling, but I hadn't been familiar with people from uh, Tennessee or Mississippi. But it was a great and trying experience, and I was very, very proud to have done that. How long was the basic training? I think at that time, basic training was 13 weeks. And what, can you describe a little bit what the training was like and what things you did? Sure can. When we were inducted, the facilities at that time were not too modern. So we were uh, set up in tents in South Carolina. And the fallacy of it being so warm is a misconception. Really? Because each day, uh, the buckets outside of our tent would be frozen. Training was very, very difficult. Uh, at that time, it was a hardship to the extent of what we had been used to as far as living. The instructors were very, very diligent, and as we realize it now, it was for our own benefit. So they didn't even have barracks at that time? At the time, when I went through, we had tents, and they later built there were, the Paris Island was the main uh, recruitment depot for the Marine Corps prior to the war. And there were brick barracks there. However, with the war coming on and the enlistment of many, many more people, they had to have temporary facilities. So when I went through boot camp, they erected tents. So you slept in a tent? Slept in a tent with a wooden floor and on cots with a mattress. Subsequent to that, when we were leaving, they were building what they call PB huts, and they were just boards. And uh, we were fortunate one time to go up to the PX, which was like our drugstore, but that was once in the 13 weeks. I have some tales that I could tell you that might be relatively uh, indiscreet, but I'll give you a prime example because this is a realistic world. At that point, the facilities for the lavatory was a copper dip tub, and it was similar to a barrel cut in half, and a cart, and it was one long elongated tub. And across that, there were two boards that were set that were we sat on. 
and every morning when you had to perform your duties, it was predicated on the water flow instead of a flush. It was a uh, gravity form of water flowing. So inadvertently, the first guy who sat at the first seat would get a wad of toilet paper, ignite it with a match, and send it down, causing everyone to leap up. But at that time, it was very, very humorous. But boot camp was a special place because you learn discipline and you learn control. And as I say, not to reiterate, but I was very, very proud to have been part of that unit. Do you remember any of your instructors from boot camp? Yeah, there was a... Of course, when you go through boot camp, you had to address instructors as sir. And I had a young corporal, and we had to call him sir. And they were, and I don't recall his name, I can honestly say, but there were two uh, drill instructors, they used to call them DIs, that were assigned to us. And of course, a very, very vivid memory I have of going to South Carolina was the discriminatory practices with uh, white and black at that time. And it was, it was amazing to us who came from the north. And as you are aware, there were only two marine depots. There was one, if you were east of the Mississippi, you went to Paris Island. If you were west of the Mississippi, you went to San Diego. Now, San Diego was a much bigger and more well-established base, but they basically had the same type of training. When you graduated from boot camp, where did you go? Well, we took numerous tests to determine what we were qualified to do. And from boot camp in South Carolina, we were transferred to uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And we were there assigned to whatever they were going to train us for. And what did they assign you to? Uh, I got assigned as a radio man. <laughs> I wasn't too very technical, but that later tied into my duties in the service. Why did they put you as a radio man? Because that's how the tests showed where you were. Well, you, you took tests to determine what your qualifications were. And as being a 19-year-old kid just out of school, you know, I had no experience as far as being a, a lathe operator. So we took tests, and I recall this test vividly, and it was to determine if the two sounds were the same. It was an audio test, and that's what qualified you to be a, a radio operator. And... Did they train you to be a radio man at Camp Lejeune? At Camp Lejeune, we went to radio school, that's correct. And how long was that? Uh, we, we were there, Eileen, from, uh, well, I got a transfer out of boot camp when I was there. We then went out to Oceanside in August of 43. I must have been there five or six months or so, yeah. Now, what was, it, what was it like at Camp Lejeune? Did you still well, have Camp tents? Le, Camp Lejeune, no. We were in uh, brick barracks at that time because we are now not, no longer recruits. We were qualified Marines. So we were then in training, and, and eventually we would be assigned to a regiment. Yeah. What was um, camp life like at Camp Lejeune? Was the treatment better because you weren't in... Basic well, anymore. Camp Lejeune, as I say, we were then part, we were actually military men then. We were not basic recruits. Yeah, it was much better. I mean, the, the conditions were, I mean, the living quarters were much better. Uh, the pay was still the same. I think when I went in, we were getting $21 a month, and I think we had to pay $10 a, a month for our life insurance. So we weren't getting wealthy, but we were happy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was good. We, uh, we weren't confronted on going to Liberty because there weren't too many facilities down there in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina at the time, yeah. Where did you go after Camp Lejeune? From Camp Lejeune, which was very, very good, and we went to Oceanside, California, which was 26 miles south of San Diego and about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. And, of course, at that time... We were assigned to a regiment, and we were there preparing to consolidate the regiment for uh, combat. Uh, Oceanside was very, very nice. Uh, of course, we used to do, we used to hitchhike, believe me when I tell you. And again, bearing in mind, I was probably a still a 19-year-old. We used to hitchhike from Oceanside, California to Long Beach, California. And that was about 90 miles on <laughs> Highway 101 
along the wealthy coast of Laguna Beach and La Jolla, which were, you know, you could have bought the whole country out there for $10, but no one had $10. That's now a luxurious resort. But a very vivid memory I have there is that, then of course, you created friendships with a bunch of fellows. And one very, very good friend of mine was a kid by the name of Joe Hanley. I don't know if he's still alive, but he was from South Philadelphia, and he was a real tough but he was in the Marine Corps, either the Marine Corps or jail. But he was a hell of a nice guy. But we, I recall again, you know, certain things that stick out in your mind. Yeah. We used to go up to Long Beach, California, and that was a, there was a bar up there, Caterers Five and Dime. And I remember distinctly we were getting drinks for a quarter. So that was then. And of course... At weekends when we go up there, we got familiar with a hotel up there. And, of course, they had no facilities for us, but they used to let us sleep in the basement where they stored uh, mattresses and everything. People, and we used to hitchhike, and big truckers used to pick us up. People were very, very concerned with the servicemen out there. Of course, we never used to go to San Diego, which was 26 miles, because there must have been like 9 million sailors there so. And we didn't go into Los Angeles because there were numerous Army personnel there. We used to go up to Long Beach. Of course, as I understand now, Long Beach is, uh, has had some depreciation as far as uh, the quality of life there and everything. Yeah. But along that 101, La Jolla and Laguna Beach, those are multi-million dollar houses now. Wow. How long did you stay in Oceanside? We departed from Oceanside on January of 1944. And as the history of our division will show, we went from, we departed at, <clears throat> pardon me, we left at San Diego, naturally, but we went right into combat from January, we left in January 1 of 44, and we went directly into an invasion on February 19th of 44. What division were you in? Fourth Marine Division. When you were training at Oceanside, did you know that you were training to go into combat? Yeah, well, we, we knew that. From Oceanside, you, you embarked from San Diego, so we knew we were going out. Yeah. Did you know where you were going? No, we had no idea of where we were going. You never had any idea of which island you were going to invade until at such time prior to maybe three or four days, so then they'd indoctrinate you and familiarize you with what you were going to do and where you were going to go. Yeah. All right, so you left... January of 44 from San Diego, and California. And what was your first combat mission that you First said? combat mission, the 4th Marine Division was the first division to take over occupied Japanese territory. We invaded the islands of, of uh, Kwajalein and, and Roy Namur in the, uh, uh, the Marshall Islands. It was a relatively short campaign. I was, just got a piece of shrapnel on my left. Like there. Which? Kwajalein or Roy Namur? Uh, I, don't, I think it was Kwajalein, yeah, because there were two, uh, two islands adjacent to each other. So then, uh, in, in fact, I will give you, if you're desirous of having, I have a picture of myself by a, a knocked out American tank on Kwajalein. Yes, uh, and well, uh, you can to attach me. that to your record. Yeah. Um, From there. Well, and those battles at Kwajalein and Roy Namur. Your your job was the radio man? At that time, I was assigned, I was in headquarters and service company of the 20th Marine Regiment, but I was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marine Infantry Division for communication purposes on that particular campaign. Yeah. Now, what, as a radio man, what did you actually do during the campaign? You, you would be in contact with regimental headquarters to determine what the need was, and they would... Uh, send the information back to the ships and etc. So we would keep in constant communications of where we're advancing and what the situation was. Yeah. Where were you located? Were you on a ship? No, no. I was not. We we would we would go in on on LSTs, and they used to call them Higgins boats in those days. And if you recall, you'd cir pictures circling in the area, and you'd go into shore, and they'd let the ramp down, and then you'd disembark and go up the beach, yeah. So no, you were already let off. I was on, on the beach, And you yes. were on the beach, yes, and then you were communicating with right. the ships. Right, um, What kind of an operation would you set up on beach? It couldn't have been too... We, we carried a small radio on our back at that time, yeah. Do you recall like what kind of radio it was? 
an SCR or something. I don't know the technical name. I'm not a technician, believe me. After, um, how long did, did the Kwajalein? I think we, we took that island in two days, and then we stayed a few days, and then we would go, we went back to the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. At that time, Maui was not a luxurious resort like it is now. Again, we went into old wooden docks, housed in tents again. Uh, we we're on the side of the mountain, constant rain. Now, as far as Liberty, there was we couldn't go to the main island because we would get we would get replacements, etc. We used to run. We used to get a recon jeep and go along a mountainside road. There was a small town called Lahaina, and we used. To, I think it's publicized in the newspapers today. We used to go there and a drug to a drugstore, and they had bootleg rum. And don't misconstrue. I wasn't a drunk. <laughs> We used to get bootleg rum for six dollars a bottle, and we were we were on Maui and we trained, and then uh, you trained for what? Trained for future missions. So then again, on uh, uh, we actually in essence we traveled on what they called APAs, which were assault personnel vehicles. They were small. Uh, Liberty ships. They were not big transports like they used to transport the army. We, we uh, in fact, we had, on some occasions, we had more time on ships maneuvering than some of the crew did on the ships. So we disembarked from Maui again for our next invasion, which was the island of Saipan, which was a big campaign. You recall the date? Yep. Uh, we invaded Saipan in July. We probably disembarked there in... March or so, March of 44. So you were really on the forefront because you were taking these islands from the Japanese. The, the 4th Marine Division was noted for making four major invasions in 12 months. And it's in the history. I'll give you a copy of it. You can return it to me. Were you um, involved in all four of those all four invasions? Of those, yeah. Okay, so tell me about the invasion of Saipan. Saipan was a much bigger invasion, which was a bigger island. That took us 30 days to, to uh, secure. So we invaded that. Casualties were relatively heavy. And history reveals that the people that resided on Saipan were committing suicide because they thought the Americans, the Japanese, had told them that the Americans were going to kill them. And there's some documentation showing people committing suicide, jumping off the cliffs, off cliffs because they were afraid the Americans were going to kill them. Now, from Saipan, we did not return to Maui. We automatically invaded uh, Tinian, T-I-N-I-A-N, and that was about 30 days later. And those were in the uh, uh, those you were those. Mariana Islands. Now, Tinian was the smaller of the two islands, and if you're familiar with World War history, Tinian was utilized as the base to bomb uh, the B-29s to bomb Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Yokohama. The uh, Ganola Gay, which was the Air Force B-29, took off from Tinian. So, we then invaded Tinian. We didn't go back to Maui from Saipan. We went right over to Tinian. So that invasion took about 15 days or so. Now in both Saipan and Tinian, were you still a radio operator? Still a radio operator. So were you one of the first people on shore? On both invasions, yes. So again, they would take the LSTs, take the, drop you off? If you, I'll show you pictures of them. It's circle and then you go in on Higgins boats, yeah. And then you would set up a radio set station? Set up a radio control, yeah, with regimental headquarters. That's correct, yeah. And who, who picked the spot on the island? Where you would invade? It was all designated by the, uh, by the regimental commander, and it shows, like, beach blue and beach red. Who, who decided where you set up the radio station? Wherever you were at the time, mm -hmm. we're fortunate enough to get in. Okay, from Tinian, 
we went back to Maui again. Now we stayed at Maui until December of 44. And then uh, I was transferred to the uh, 14th Marine Regiment, which was a field artillery regiment. And I was assigned to the forward observation officer and we were assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 25th Marine Infantry Division. We had the good fortune there when we left Maui. A young fellow and myself had a day to, uh, to uh, get off the ship in the main island and go ashore for a few hours. And I wish I had that picture because I sent the picture home to my wife, who eventually my daughter has it, and it shows the marks where it was censored out so they couldn't tell where we were. They, they had blanked it out to censor. But my, wife, my daughter has it in Essex. And then we boarded and we invaded the island of Iwo Jima on February 19th, 1945. Now the main reason for invading Iwo Jima, now this is what I learned from history, was to protect the B-29s that were bombing Japan. And they were, uh, we had to have a base for fighter escort. So they took off from Iwo Jima, which was only 600 miles from Japan. And many uh, B-29s that were uh, hit or disabled would land on Iwo Jima. I honestly think that that was a, a waste because I think the higher ups, and I'm no general, but they misinterpreted the resistance that we would get. And we took a shellacking on Iwo Jima. The casualties are extremely heavy. Uh, in fact, over at Central Connecticut State University at that memorial, if you've ever reviewed that memorial, you'll see that there were 94 men from Connecticut that were killed. And my children and myself donated an amount of money and we're on that big uh, black plaque in the front. And they in inserted bricks along the uh, perimeter of the monument to uh, designate these were the people that were there. And there was a young doctor who was, I think, a replacement up at Iwo, a doctor Gentile, who formed that with no federal funds. It was all through private contributions. And it's an exact duplicate of the, memor the Marine Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, as I say, I had the good fortune, and I say this with tongue in cheek, to get wounded on the second day. Uh, we had miscalculated the resistance we would have accomplished. And I've got a story there that I was, there was a gentleman from East Hartford who was writing a book on the invasion, and I'll give you the copy that I have there, the portion of it. And I was assigned with the forward observation officer. And at that time, we were with 75 millimeter cannons, which were very, very small. When you say you were assigned to the forward observation artillery, was your job still as radio? At radio did you have man, a different... Because at that time, what we, what we did, if the guns ever got in, the forward observation officer, who was a lieutenant, would tell us what position or what coordinates to aim the guns at, and then we would send it back by the radio. So in our group, there was a, the uh, FO officer. Do you there remember was, his name? The fellow I was with was a fellow by the name of Johnson. He was a Carolinian. Uh, there was a, the assistant was a corporal by the name of Don Matthews. There was myself, and there was a... a a security man by the name of Joseph Sarno from Boston. We were in the initial uh, wave there. We got in about 100 yards the first day. The second day, we got up to our right flank about 100 yards. We stayed there, and at that night, a phosphorus shell landed on Mr. Sarno and myself, and we were evacuated immediately. The army took us off in what they call ducks. They were amphibious tanks. I was then on a converted APA, which was a hospital ship. To show you how many casualties they had, they were going to take us back to Saipan, 
Now this is only the 21st of February and the invasion was the 19th. They were going to take us back to Saipan, but that hospital was filled up so they couldn't take us there. So we stayed in that staging area for two weeks, picked up the remain some more casualties, and they took us up, myself and the group, to the Army Station Hospital in Guam. We were there in until April. Then we set sail from there to Pearl Harbor. They took off quite a few of the guys at Pearl. And then I stayed on and they took me back to San Diego. At that time, they, they thought they were going to have to draft, the graft skin. And the procedure back 60 years ago is a lot different than it is now. So Let's the, go back to exactly what happened. When you say, they, can you describe what a phosphorus shell is? Because that's what you said, they dropped the phosphorus shell. They dropped the phosphorus shell. It was just all the remnants of, of the phosphorus that landed on us and burned the boat. Was it an American or a Japanese? It must have been Japanese because they would utilize that to illuminate the area to see where the invasion troops were. So the burning phosphorus burning is what phosphorus landed, on, landed on myself and Mr. Sarno. And what part of you was burned? I was burning my legs and my hands. And what about Mr. Sarna? Mr. Sarna was burned the same way on his legs, yeah. I don't know where he is now or anything, but... So then, as I say, went to the... Uh, we were taken off onto the hospital, onto the converted APA, which was a hospital ship, up to Guam, from Guam to Pearl. Now, what was the treatment like on the hospital ship? They, uh, they immediately gave me plasma. It didn't require a uh, a transfusion at that time, and they gave me plasma, and then they were giving you uh, morphine for pain, yeah. Did they have nurses on board, or was it all uh, As I recollect, it was doctors and corpsmen on. It was just a troop ship that was converted to a hospital ship. It was not a big major hospital ship. No, there were no nurses there. When we got to Guam, there were Army nurses in that facility. You know. Do you recall which hospital in Guam you went I to? I just know it was the Army Station Hospital in Guam. Because you want to remember, Guam was now in the hands of the, of the Americans. Yeah. I have no idea what number, etc. Yeah. How long did it take you on the APA uh, hospital ship to get to Guam? Are we talking days or weeks? Well, figure I was there. I can give you almost exact. We were on the hospital ship for two weeks, so that would be, say, well, they were picking up other, other uh, casualties. So figure the 19th to the end of February. So it took from uh, March 1st to uh, about a week to get up to Guam, you know. And then how long did you stay in the hospital at Guam? We departed Guam probably, it must have taken us seven to ten days to get back to Pearl. How long were you actually in the hospital on Guam? Just a couple from, of days? Oh, no. It must have been from, uh, I figure, the, uh, March 1st, seven days, in the middle of March. Probably a month or so in the Army Hospital in Guam, yeah. What was uh, the care like at that Army Hospital? Very good. It was a regular, up-to-date hospital with modern facilities, doctors and nurses, yeah. Okay, then you left Guam. We departed from Guam, and we came back to Pearl. And as I say, they took off some of the fellows that didn't require additional treatment, and they, I'm sure, got replaced and went back in. But then we went, on to, we went into San Diego, and I got there, and it was April 14th at the Naval Hospital in San Diego. April 14th, what year? 1945. And that's when they wanted to do skin grafts? They, they were, I was in the ward that they were doing skin grafts, and I vividly, again, certain things stick out in your mind. There was a fellow in the next bed to me who was on an aircraft carrier, and he had walked into a propeller in his face. Now, in those days, uh, grafting, they would take your skin and they would grow. It was almost like you would be grafting on a tree or something, and you'd see a huge knot of skin going up. But mine was coming along... And they used to wrap it in saline bandages all the time. My hands were healing, but my leg was still wrapped. And I recall, after I think I'd been there a month or so, and I finally was able to get liberty, and I had to wrap my leg in, in uh, 
in plastic so it couldn't get wet to go on Liberty Hill. And I was there, I was there from, as I say, February 14th, and then I got a uh, uh, sick leave furlough. I had 30 days in June of 45 to come home. So I was home for 30 days and then went back to the hospital again. And I was there and then they said I was all cured. So then I got a 30 day transfer to the Marine barracks in Philadelphia. And that was because I got separated in October of 45. So that would have been about September, 20, about a month prior to that, about September 29th. And they used to give you 30 days and uh, 10 days travel time. So I came home for 30 days. I turned into the Marine barracks in Philadelphia and then I got discharged because the Marine Corps inaugurated a point system then, yeah. So as I say, I was fortunate enough to have the war end in February of 45. And the boy that replaced me, that took over my position, was, was a boy by the name of Maurice, Maurice Goodrow from New Bedford, Massachusetts. He took over as radio man for me, and he died of wounds received in combat. On Iwo Jima? Yeah. Do you have lasting scars or effects from your burns? Yeah, I get disability, and I have scars on my leg, yeah. Did it hamper your life at all? No, no, it didn't hamper my life at all. Did you receive any medals or citations? Just, just the two Purple Hearts in our division got... <laughs> just two Purple yeah, Hearts? Well, yeah. And then uh, we got a Navy commendation, a presidential citation. And as I say, we were the... the I'm very proud of that division. It's not only me, but the numerous guys in it because of recapturing Japanese uh, held territory. And we were, you know, four major invasions in a period of one year. And it was, it was to me, it's a, it's a record. That's huge. Now, because you were involved with those four major invasions and you were actually on the the first wave going in, um, you actually saw a lot of combat. Yeah. Um, do you recall what the casualties were on any of those four evasions? Yeah, uh, Roy and Amour, they weren't too bad because their resistance wasn't that great. Saipan, they were pretty heavy. Uh, Tinian, we had jumped over from Saipan, they weren't too bad, but uh, Iwo Jima was, as I say, was, was devastating going in. And it was not like some of the previous marine invasions where the poor guys couldn't even get in because they hit barriers in the water. And as I say, fortunately for me and unfortunately for the Marines on Iwo Jima, they encountered the difficulty as they proceeded to go up the island to get uh, the possession of the air of the uh, airfield, and then the historic event of raising the flag on Iwo Jima that didn't take place until the fifth day, and, and as I say, I was off at that point. Yeah. Can you describe what it was like going in in combat? You yeah, must sure. have had. Uh... I can honestly decide, describe it because. Again, you're a 19-year-old, know-nothing, smart-ass kid. And I use that word as a smart-ass kid. And you had no, no fear. But then when we started going into Tinian and Iwo, our motto used to be back alive in 45. And then we were all, you were fearful. I mean, you weren't a coward, but you were afraid. And I mean, I think it was a natural reaction. And it was not only young, new guys like myself, but I mean it was the Marines who had been in the Marine Corps, who had been career Marines, and I'm sure they felt the same way. And I think that's a human reaction. You know, this is a nice place, but we don't like to leave it. Now, John, I'm going to ask you some questions about daily life in the various places you were. 
How did you stay in touch with family when you were overseas? Now, you said you were already married when you went overseas? Oh, no, I didn't even know my wife. Oh, you didn't? No. Oh, so you no. were a single young guy? Single young guy. Like every single young guy at 19. Unfortunately, I used to write, I had, you know, numerous friends you met in school and all over and everything. And, and I'll show you. I was going with a young lady a Polish young lady who was going to the Vesper George School of Art in Boston when I was up there. And she had been a Polish refugee and she had been in the bombing of Warsaw. And she, there's a picture of my head she drew in there. And I'll let you take that if you want it. But, you know, I was a young, frivolous guy hacking around and, you know. So how did you stay in touch with your family while you well, were overseas? I used to write to my mother every day and and I, when I came home, she had awards and all the letters. But then when she sold her house and everything, I don't know where it went. There was a box, a, a, a big suit box filled of all the letters and just disappeared. And I was unable to recapture any of that stuff. But I used to write to her all the time. Of course, when I got hit the first time, I didn't write and tell her anything. And then she got the notice and then she knew a lady in the Red Cross and they were checking up on me and all that baloney, you know. But as they say, you're a, you know, you're a young, and I hate to use that phrase, why is that skin? Right. Now, you just mentioned the first time you got hit. We didn't talk very much about that. Um, when and where and exactly what happened the first time you got hit? I just got shrapnel in the back of my left leg, which just was very, very minor. It just broke the skin and all. Was, Did you realize it right away when you got hit? Yeah, well, you know, you're bleeding, and you know, but I mean, that that was not a, it was not a, I don't think it was a serious thing, but the medics took care of it, and then we got back to uh, to Maui, they had to bandage it up and take care of it and all that stuff, but no, it, it wasn't that severe a hit, you know. But, but he, Mom he, found out about it. He, well, yeah, unfortunately, because they sent the, the you know, the reward home, yeah. What was the food like in all the various places you were? Well, it, it, the food wasn't bad, but in the field, you know, we, we, we run rations all the time in the, in the field. And of course, when we'd be aboard ship, it would be pretty good, you know, going over because, you know, they had, they had, it wasn't field, uh, field kitchens. But when we got on the islands, and of course, for any length of time, it was not good, no. I remember once on Saipan, we had another fellow from South Carolina. There was a chicken, and he got the chicken, and he cleaned it, and we did it up ourselves. But we were on rat, you know, we'd eat K rations and all that stuff the whole time. But you know, that was secondary at that time because you were young, and, and food was not the thing. And I mean, you know, you, you just accepted it. And everybody was the same, though, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it was just... I, I can honestly say that the training that was embedded into us, that we were we were not an individual, we were part of an entire group, and that was very important to me. Did you always have uh, enough supplies, um, ammunition? Yep. No, I can honestly equipment. say we were we were we were well well equipped, ample ammunition, ample ample uh, ample uh, arms. The only thing on Iwo, when we got in, as I say, I got hit the third, the 21st, our guns were not, we were in before our guns came in because of the situation. But no, we, we were well equipped. You know, we had, I mean, we, they even gave us wristwatches for timing and all. So that, no, I can honestly say as far as equipment and clothing, we were never confronted with, you know, like you read about them in Korea where they didn't have, uh, they had summer clothing in the winter. Now we were well, well, of course we are never in a cold climate, but no, we were well equipped. I can honestly say that, yeah. Did you feel pressure or stress? No, no pressure or stress. As I say in later years, as we kept going in, you, you got a little fearful. And, well, because you knew what you were going into. Well, you knew what you were going into. Initially you didn't, you know, it's like any new experience. It's exciting and and glamorous, and you know, you see a lot of movies, but after a while, it gets to be not so nice. Did you do anything special for good luck? I, I, I'm a, I, I'm a, I think I'm a relatively uh, religious man. Yeah, I, uh, I, 
I, I can only say I pray a lot. I'm a Roman Catholic. And I have over there my original dog tags. And, and the, I'll show it to you. It's, it's an old uh, shoelace I carried around. And there's a cross and a miraculous medal on that. And then... And did you wear that? I still have it right there. One of them, yeah. Uh, one I kept in my keychain. It's all worn out. You can't see it. But in the Marine Corps, our dog tags were brass. And I don't know if you've ever seen them, and I'll show you one. They're different than the ones in the Army. What did you do for entertainment? In the military? Yep. When you get leave, did you get leave periodically? Uh, as I, no, we didn't get that much leave. I, I, uh, after boot camp, I got seven days I came home and then went back. And then I didn't get a leave until uh, the one in uh, from San Diego when I came home. And then my good friends were home. And, of course, at that time, I was a little older. And, you know, you just hacked around. Right? No, you didn't have any leave when you were overseas? No, no. What did you do well, for entertainment? Well, there was no place to go. Yeah. <laughs> What did you do for entertainment in the downtown in between those invasions? Like we, we had, like I had a ball go, we used to play baseball, go to the PX, drink 2.3 beer, you know. Did you see any USO shows? Once. Where? I went to the Hollywood Canteen once. What, and that was in the United States? In the United States, but I never went to the USO shows or any of that stuff, no. You know, like I don't belong to the Legion or any of that. I didn't do any of that. No. Do you recall any particularly humus, humorous or unusual events? Yeah. You want to tell me about them? Sure. When we were in Oceanside, this boy, this boy who cooked the chicken for us in Saipan, Jackson, he was a real southerner. And at that time, we were in Oceanside at the main base. And the United States then inaugurated a program where they had female Marines. Well, Mr. Jackson got a little excited, got drunk, stole a Jeep, and went down to the ladies' barracks. And, of course, got arrested, got picked up by the MPs. We thought it was funny. He didn't think so. But you, you didn't go along with him. No, <laughs> he was the only one. No, none of us went. But that was funny. Do you recall any other humorous events or unusual things that happened? Yeah. We were in radio school in Camp Lejeune, and we had a uh, staff sergeant, a southerner, who was no good. And he was, uh, he was an instructor in radio school. And a boy, and I say a boy, he was maybe 21 or 22, a little older than us, gave him some static. And the sergeant had him arrest, had the MPs pick him up, and he had confined him to bread and water for 30 days, a full meal every third day, because he said something like chicken chip to some program that the instructor was saying. They were pretty strict as far as that goes. And then I remember another one over in, in the Oceanside, not a humorous one, where a fellow was confined to the brig, and he was trying to escape, and he didn't stop, and the uh, MP shot him in the leg with buckshot. That one wasn't funny. Uh, well, that's, you know. Did you keep a, a journal or a diary? No, just memories. What did you think of the officers and of your fellow Marines? Ninety-nine percent of the officers were very, very good. The majority of officers and fellow Marines that were regular Marines were all Southerners. I, I, I don't understand why, but they were. We only had that same sergeant that was teaching radio school on Saipan, got a little cowardly, and they had to take him out of combat. And, he was not too good. He was a Sergeant Honeycutt. I remember his name vividly. H-U-N-I-C-U-T-T. -T. He was not a nice person. And he was removed? He was removed. 
Did you stay in touch with any of your fellow Marines after the war? I was in touch with a fellow by the name of Tim Cody. Can you spell his last name? C-O-D-Y. Fordham graduate prior to going in the Marine Corps. He was in the 14th Marines with me. Uh, Tim ended up working at Union Carbide, and we used to rent a summer home after we were married down at White Sands Beach, and Tim had a representative from India with him one, one summer, and they came and stayed with us for the two weeks, and we had this Indian man with us, yeah. Kept in touch with Tim. There was a boy by the name of Bill Cooper, who was since deceased, Worked for the telephone company, lived up in Warehouse Point. And then just recently, there was a boy that went to grammar school with me by the name of Billy Doran. He was a telephone man in the Marine Corps. And he, he was an Iwo Jima survivor. And he, he, in fact, went to St. Peter's Grammar School with me. He was about a year younger than I, and he just died a while ago. And I kept in touch with him. And they were local boys, and that's the extent of it, yeah. Do you recall your last day in service? My last day in service, yeah. What was that like? When I turned into the uh, getting ready for discharge down in Philadelphia, they offered to in to rate you one rate higher than your current rate to keep you in because they were looking for recruit looking for personnel to remain in the service. And I said, I think it was a major, I said, no thank you. I wanted to go home. What did you do in the days immediately following your discharge? <laughs> what didn't I do? <laughs> well, you know, again, I had no affiliation with any young lady. I used to write to quite a few people and everything, and I, and I bummed around with the rest of the guys. We were getting $20 a month, and, uh, you know, didn't work. You didn't, returned home to your, your family home in Hartford? Returned to my home in Hartford, yeah. And I lived, lived in the South End of Hartford, lived with my parents. And yeah. bummed around for a while? Bummed around with the guys <laughs> for a while. Sure, that's what it was, bumming around. You know, renewed relationship with all your old friends and everything. And then uh, that was the extent of it. And then did you go back to work or back to school? Well, at that time, I didn't go back to school, which I should have done, but I didn't. But you never talk about the past. Uh, we were hacking around, and the Veterans Administration at that time was in Hartford. They had two facilities, and they were very, very active because there were so many people coming back. So a bunch of us went down. We got jobs at the VA in Hartford, Connecticut. At that time, it was on the corner of Lewis Street and Pearl Street, and that's when I met Mrs. Krebs. Really? Yep. Was she working at the VA she, also? She, she had worked in the VA in Newington, and then she was working in the office there, and she used to fingerprint the new, uh, new uh, employees, and that's how I got to meet her. And then, So you got to hold hands early. Well, we didn't hold hands. <laughs> we didn't hold hands. Uh, and then, and then, you know, we, we, we went down, we were file clerks just to get a job, to do something. We used to go to the beach all the time. So I worked there. Uh, and then I met her, and then we were getting engaged, and the whole, whole McGill and Cuddy of it. And then uh, I was there seven, we got married, and I met her in 40, let's see now, 40, 40. Met her. We got engaged in 46, got married in 47. I stayed in the VA for about seven years, but I was making nothing. And then I went to work for the uh, Hartford Federal Savings. I'm sure you don't remember that. And then I what did you do there? I was a uh, manager of the loan service department. And then I left them and I worked for a bigger one in, in Worcester, and I managed their office. And then in 1972, they wanted me to go to the home office in Worcester. I was assistant VP at the time, and they wanted me, because the vice president of the mortgage officer was retiring, and they wanted me to go to Worcester, and I didn't want to move, so I retired. In 1972? Yeah. 
And then I went to work in the town of Glastonbury. I was collector of revenue, and then I retired from them in 1983. And I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was always kind of an adventurous guy. So when I was working in the VA, I was always looking ahead. So I sent out, filled out uh, an application for an appointment for a different job. And I sent it into the Civil Service Commission. So my wife and I were going to get engaged in December of 46 on Thanksgiving Day, and I still have the telegram, Thanksgiving Day of 1946, I got a telegram from the War Department saying that they, I could have a position in Yokohama, Japan for a minimum tour of duty for two years. Now that would be right after the war ended. So she lived up in, up by Rocky Ridge, by Trinity College, and I lived in the south end of Hartford. I ran up there all the way and said, look, and she said, well, you can go, but that's going to be the end of our friendship. But it was a great opportunity, and I, I as I say, I still have the, the, the telegram in my archives. So you chose to stay home and chose get married? To stay home, which was a wise, not a wise decision, but yeah, it was 1946. It was, it was great. It would have been a great position. And then we got married, and we were very fortunate. We have three children, eight grandchildren, five great-grandchildren. Been happy and healthy. Had our ups and downs. But we're very fortunate. We John, did you join any veterans organizations? Nothing. Life member of the Iwo Jima Memorial Association. Do you um, participate in parades or nothing at all? No. Are you involved with any of the activities? Do a lot of volunteering work, though. I mentored a boy at the middle school here this past year to learn how to read. The lady across the street retired from Travelers. I worked with the, uh, the, the, the uh, blood drive there all the time. I... Uh, I volunteer at the Hartford Marathon. I do a lot of volunt I did a lot of volunteering work in, in Florida. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? I I think it it uh, influenced my thinking about war. I think one thing that stuck out in my mind very vividly, and of course periodically periodically you'll see. Uh, letters to the editor regarding uh, nuclear warfare and the atom bomb, and there was so much opposition to Truman making the decision to drop the bomb. But I think it was a very, very wise thing because we would have had millions and millions of casualties. And my theory, as basic it may as it may seem, there's no such thing as a friendly war. It, 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 it's a hard concept, but there's you know, a war is a war. Have you attended any reunions? How would you say your experience in the military affected your life? Oh, I think it, 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 it uh, was very influential in teaching me to respect life. I think I, I as I keep saying about a a young smart ass kid, I, I think it taught me a lot of responsibility and to be cooperative with an individual, not to, to, to take myself as one person. I really do. I think that was it. John, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Any other to incidents? Go on and ever, and as I keep saying, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate that I've had a good long marriage. It'll be 63 years this September. We've, we've got a good family. Everybody is healthy and wise. I don't know how wealthy, but no, I, I, I can honestly say that, and I'm not being blowing a lot of smoke, but I, I, I've had a good life. You know, I have a few pacemaker and a few other stupid little things like that, but uh, I've had a good life. Well, John, I'd like to thank you for your service like and thank you for the interview. 
Well, if I keep saying to you that my service was only part of 20 million men and all the poor civilians who sustained the hardships that they did, then believe me when I, I say that in all sincerity, because right now, when you analyze the situation with the conflicts we're in, unless you have a brother, a sister, a father, I mean, how does that affect me individually? It doesn't. It doesn't. Affect, I mean, you know, if one of my grandsons had to go, then I'd be concerned. And I am concerned with the poor boys over there because they don't know who they're fighting. But, I mean, it, it, it's not a universal thing. I mean, it should be universal and not at all. And I feel sorry for those people, both female and males. I really and truly do. But I'm not a politician, so I can't control it. Thank you.